the medical data and the humanitarian work. Uh, I'm very happy. I'm pleased to welcome you all with your busy schedules for coming MAN office and uh, MAN forum today. Today we'll be discussing issues related on humanitarian and we have a veteran and expert on this field. Dr. Hana, Dr. Hani Albanna is uh, have a lifeline achievement. Uh, he is the co-founder co and former president of Islamic Relief, the largest Western Muslim NGO in the world. Dr. Uh, Al Hana visited many countries, over 70 countries, in pursuit of relief people from suffering, encouraging better understanding and aiding uh, bridge building work. He have been recognized in many forums and many work, most notably in the order of British Empire, OPE 2014. He got honorary degree from the University of Birmingham. He, he have lifetime achievement award, Muslim Power 100 award, ASEAN Joel Award 2016, and many others. We have the opportunity to welcome today in our office, man office and forum, to talk about issues relating on humanitarian and aid dividends. Uh, my name is Abbas Abdi, and I will serve as the moderator of this event. And, and we will have some ground rules before we start uh, our forum. Uh, as we don't have mics, so we expect you to maintain the silence. And I will give 10 to 15 minutes to Dr. Uh, Hannah to talk about issues related on our topic uh, as he will give us some introductory remarks. I will begin by asking him what, uh, what motivated him to start Islamic Relief and issues relating on the inception, the challenges that he faced. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Hanna. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you today. I'm very happy to see the young, the young, the young, the young, the young, keep staying young till tomorrow. <laughs> the young generation whom we have a great uh, dream about you. Alhamdulillah that Somalia came coming out from being a failing state to a semi-fragile state. And this is something your role will be played by you to enable it to take it from fragile state into a stable state. So my first question to each and every one of you, what is your role? Before you find somebody who is coming from abroad to ask him or her, to give you a solution to your problem, you have to find a role for yourself in finding a solution in your problem. We cannot import solution from abroad. We cannot get someone who is a passenger to give you a golden solution from abroad. It's up to us here as young people, as the current and the future generation, to be empowered to help to get out from this state to another state? This is my first question, brothers and sisters. Is it clear? Is it clear? Yes. Do you have a role to play in building Somalia state or not? Yes. Can one stand up and tell me what his role or her role is? Come on, I'm not going to give a lecture for half an hour or 40 minutes. I'm going to pick on them, okay? Who can start? Ah, Somali cannot be like this. Yes, sister, stand up. What's your role? <coughs> Sorry? A good citizen. Okay, fine. That's good. Anybody else? In your speciality? You have to have a role. We don't say without having a role. You see, the title was supposed to be, are we going to be aid-dependent forever or not? 
for the last 30 and 40 years, we have been depending on aid. But now we cannot anymore. I've got strong diaspora community abroad. We've got young generation who are coming from abroad to live here. Okay? We've got a lot of resources. We learned a lot. We went from stage to stage to stage to stage. Are we going to be depending on aid forever? Under the mercy of others forever? So if we are not, what are we going to do? Yes, sir. Um, my name is Abdullah. I am the head of Hudud Foundation, which is the very corporate foundation in the Somalia. Sorry. But the vision of the foundation is to make Somalia a better place to live. How? The slogan of the foundation is local health for local people. Local health for he's talking about localization. Localization is the key answer for all our problems. We have to start at home. As we know from the teaching in the West, charity starts where? At home. Zakat starts at home for your close relatives and your close neighborhood. So what, what anybody else can give, tell me who is her role and who is her role? Yes? No? What do you want to do in Somalia? Yes, sir. Be an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. Yeah. Good. Very good. Another one. Yes. To be a good teacher, so that. Good. Teacher. Teacher. Yes. To excel in your profession, whether you are a teacher, yeah. or you are a doctor, or you are a politician, or you are a businessman, whatever it is. Like the sister at the beginning said, good citizen. Okay. What else? Anybody else? How can we build the community? Can we build the community? Can we build the community? How? To good, governance. good governance. That's fine. Anything else? Anything else? So why I'm asking this question? It's you are going to give Somalia independence. Not a foreigner like myself, or not a visitor, who can give you a sweet nothing and give, give you very nice speeches, and you came out of the meeting having nothing. It's you who have to stand up and build a community. It's you who have to stand up and build a coalition. Nowadays, we cannot live without coalition. Nowadays, we have to build a strong civil society sector whether we like it or not. If we want to come out of this dependency situation, we have to strengthen the civil society sector in Somalia. We have to make Somalia stable. How? Anybody can tell me how can we stabilize Somalia? You have to, to, to talk to me. I'm not going to talk forever, huh? Because I'm going to extend my to, to 10 minutes and to 50 minutes because of this discussion. I will, I will be giving questions. So. No, 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 no. You give the question later on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have, to, I have to wake them up because I'm not here as an imam or a sheikh or somebody who is going to give a fairy story and what. No. I'm a worker like you and I'll ask you what to do. What's your role? And how, come, how can we? achieve our goals and objectives. The question which I want to ask, who are we? One of the questions, brother. Who are we? We are Somali people. Well, you are Somali people. What does it mean, being Somali? Yes. What does it mean of being Somali? We are patriotic. Huh? We are patriotic citizens. Patriotic citizens. Patriotic. Yes. Loyal to the country. Fine. What we need to do? service before our country. Okay, that's one more point. Anybody else? What we want to do? <coughs> Each one of us has a dream for Somalia. Each one of us has a vision for Somalia. Each one of us want to build Somalia. Each one of us would like Somalia to be the richest and the best country on earth. What to do to do that? Yes, sister? The best, the, the best you can, yeah. the best you can. Do, do, do your best, okay? Anybody else can move me because I I'm just uh, want to be moved by you. 
Yes. I think the, one of the key things is going to be the building the local economy. Building what? Building the economy. Of the country. Building the economy. Yeah. Building civil society. Building once, the economy. Once you build the economy. How do you build the economy? Through maybe uh, enabling or. Enabling. Enabling local capacity. Local capacity. Uh, supporting the local. Supporting the local. Uh, maybe supporting the local production. Okay. Okay. I mean the local economy. Yeah, I'm not an economist, yeah. but if I understand what economy means, economy has to be built bottom up. Yeah. Bottom up. Don't wait for loans. Loans will strangle you. Has to be bottom up. Has you have to we have to change the local citizen into a productive citizen, whether he as a pastoralist or farmer or a businessman, or a teacher, or whatever it is. Bottom up, local market, local citizen, local economy. We have all the resources in our country to build our economy. This is what to do. How to do this? How to do, how to build the economy, or how to build the state? Create opportunities. Create what? Opportunities. opportunities, provide opportunities, employment, okay. Natural cohesion. Not eh? Natural cohesion. Cohesion. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Promotion of local production. Promotion of local production. Very good. Anybody else? Building skills. Yeah. Starting from the main what you do is investing in the human capital. Investing in the human capital. And you, you are more important than oil, gas, land, livestock, and the ocean itself. Because Allah has created this ocean for you. So the ocean is serving you. The land is serving you. The sky is serving you. See how many servants are serving you? Are you happy? Very good. So this is how, how we need to look at it. We have all the resources, here and here. It's difficult to do, but we can do it. Why we are doing all this? Because we? We need to be independent. We need to be independent? Yes. Okay, anybody else? We have a dream. Huh? We have a dream and we want to... We need to fulfill our dream, okay? Yes. Anybody else? We need to fulfill our goal. Our goals, to fulfill our goals, anybody else? Because we love Somalia. You said, first one of you said that you have to be a partisan to our country. We have to love, we have to love Somalia, that's why we are going to do, to do all this in, in actually what we are doing now. If we don't believe in ourselves, if we don't believe in our country, if we don't believe in our religion, if we don't believe in our God, we cannot do anything. We'll be stretching our hands forever. And you'll be humiliated by donors or by foreigners. Despite the fact that Allah SWT made this land an extremely rich land. Extremely what? Rich land. And you see, people from outside know how wealthy Somalia is. But we do not know. To do this, to achieve this, we have to build organizations. We have to change the culture. We have to make a conducive atmosphere for everybody and anybody to work together. We should not leave anybody behind. We should include everybody. We should invest in human capital, as one of the brothers said. We should invest in women. We should invest in youth. We should, we should, we should put a strategy for our country. Do we have a strategy? National strategy, not a political party strategy. Do you have a national strategy for our country? I'm a Somali now. I'm talking as, a, as I am one of you. Do we have a national strategy for our country? And for how long? Five years? Ten years? Twenty years? Thirty years? Does or do, does or do that all the political parties, did they have a national strategy for Somalia? Most of the political country, uh, sorry, uh, political parties in Somalia are still young. Isn't it? They might not have the experience 
But we need them to sit down together. This is what you can do as young generation. To force them to sit down to have a national strategy, a strategy being identified by all of them. It doesn't matter who is going to rule. Whether you are the new president, will you become the new president? Inshallah. And the prime minister? <laughs> Can you shake hands? <laughs> no, no, no. Who's this? I'm uh, his boss. Huh? I'm his boss now. <laughs> anyway. So, that's why. Do, do we know how to invite the tribal leaders to understand how to build the new state of Somalia? It's a big challenge, isn't it? Can, any, can anyone put, me, put a solution for me? How can we work with the tribal leaders? So this is another challenge. The political leaders of political, different, different political parties must sit down, look objectively at Somalia, at my political party, at my group, at my clan, at my history, or my jama'a, or my ideology. This is what we want you as young people. This is why we want you, I've come to repeat it many times. This is why we want you as young people to stand up and tell them enough is enough. Enough is enough. We have to build Somalia no matter who's going to lead Somalia. We have to build Somalia no matter which group. We have to lay down. We have to lay down the foundation of peace Justice, fairness, and equality for our country. Or to be very proud of our history, of our culture, of our values, of our religion, of our land, even of our arts and music and drama and all these sort of things. Because we are looking at Somalia, you are not looking about my tribe or my clan or my political party or my jama'a. If we start to look, to look at to see only the small parts of Somalia, we make Somalia many Somalia. I gave you my experience when I said this morning in another meeting, when we tried to visit South Sudan in 2003, I was going to, I was ignorant. I did not know that there are two Souths. Souths controlled by the government in Khartoum and Souths controlled by uh, the SPLM in, in Nevasha. But anyway, when I sat down with one of those uh, leaders, he told me, unfortunately at that time, it's 2003, it might not be one Sudan or two Sudan, it might be five or six or seven. I said, why? He said, because each one of us has got his land and his army. So if we differ with one another, even the South might not be one or two or three or four. That's what we, you know, we need to look at this statement which has been mentioned by one of the uh, political leaders at that time. Do we want one Somalia? If you want one Somalia, you have to give in some of your ego to the greater Somalia. We have to learn how to build peace, build the community, build civil society organizations, which is very important, build the economy from bottom to up, actually, and empower people, and invest in human capital, and protect the wealth of the country, and educate the, the, the tribal leaders. I don't know what you call them here, tribal leaders or clan. This has to be on board because they make a decision, but they need to know you have the vision as a young man and young woman, but you have to marry their vision, your vision to their vision without undermining them because they must not be as educated as you are. You are university degree graduates, you have PhD, you have master, you have, you have, you have, you have all this experience, which you don't have, but they have the, the control and the political decision. There's one, 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 one chair here. Uh, there's one here, one here. So, uh, is, 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 is what I'm, I'm, I'm saying is clear for you? So the challenge is to convince as young people, now I'm talking to the young people, to, take all, to, talk, to tell all the politicians to agree on a national strategy for the country, no matter who's going to lead the country. It's number one. Number two is also to agree to go around and lobby all the tribal leaders. You are a part of it, but you are a part of Somalia. You are not Somalia. Your jama'a is not Somalia. Your group is not Somalia. Your clan is not Somalia. We are all Somalia. Huh? It's for all of us. 
Because Somalia has a lot to give and to offer to all of us. Is my one minute? Yes, yes Mr. Chair. You should become a TV presenter. Uh, we have radical groups in the country. It's a big challenge. We have to find a, a, an innovative way to deal with them. We can't move in certain area unless we find a solution. Unless and until we find solution. and you are the people who will find the solution. The solution is local. The solution is local. The solution is local. And it might not need a lot of money. It might need a lot of reconciliation. Have you seen Rwanda? You remember the case of Rwanda? You remember what happened in Rwanda? In one, in less, in one year, or less than that, how many? Less, less than one million have been slaughtered by the, the tribal war between the two tribes. They lost nearly 800,000 or 900,000 people. But they paid this very high price. Now, the economy of Rwanda is booming. One of the fastest economies in Africa. Nowadays, even this is unfortunately happening in Mali. Ethnic conflict. Who is creating this? Who is creating this in our country? Or in Mali, or in Rwanda, or any or South Sudan, whatever it is. This is something which needs a lot of knowledge. Because you are, all of you are highly qualified individuals. And the hope is in you to make a stable state. My last point before this chairman kicks me out, because I can see your, your shoes are going to do this. With me. Somalia will never be stable unless we build state institution. It, state is an institution is different to the government. State institution in judiciary, in, in, in economy, in statistical, all these kind of things, in police. This has to be a state institution, not to be governed, not to be governed by the government. To be independent. The same thing the military as a state institution. How can we build the state institution? It's very important. And you are the people who will be able to do that by putting our hands together, our resources together, and the vision together collectively. You know why I'm, I'm very hopeful in, in what I'm talking today? Because I can see the solution in you because you still have about 30 or 40 or 50 years to give. For me, I might have five or six or 10 months to give. But you have the 50 years, you have the 40 years, you have the vision, you have the love, you have the care, you have the knowledge, you have the education, you have the know-how. If people like you fail, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be very angry, not with me, but with you, or with all of us. We have to change our belief into action. Prophet said, الإيمان ما ما إيه ما وقر في القلب وصدقه العمل. إيمان is what is in the heart. It's not enough. Translated into action. Action. إيمان is action. Believe is action. Believe is not a speech in a mosque. Or believe is just not going to Hajj 20 times in your life. Or making uh, what they call the night prayer for 10 hours every night. What these 10 hours of praying will have an impact on the local community. This is the belief, the impact. Belief is impact. Belief is impact. Not talk. Huh? Not advice. Belief is impact. Belief is a fingerprint and footprint for you. Your belief become a milestone for the generation to come. Your legacy will be seen after we die. Because you leave something behind to the community who was waiting for the golden solution from you. And you did it. And you did it. Believe in your community. Believe in yourself. Believe in your history. Believe in Somalia. Believe in your religion, your culture, and all these parts of the greater belief. But all this has to be translated into action. You want me to sit down?
He gave me another. <laughs> Who was clapping? Was him? <laughs> okay. That's for us. Very important for us. How many Somali are outside the country? Don't let people to divide us on the location of the diaspora. It's very dangerous. These are the Norwegian, the Danish, the Dutch, the British, the American. Never be careful. It could be a very divisive. The diaspora have to have the collective vision for the future strategy of Somalia as well. So the diaspora division has to marry the CSO division has to marry, sorry, vision, not division. Uh, vision has to marry the political vision, the community leaders' vision, and the uh, clan vision as well. As the, all these visions have to come to a central pool. Have to come to a central pool, one central pool. You don't come and make a strategy different, my strategy different, your strategy is different, the strategy, no. This would be dividing the country. I'm very hopeful because you have the brain. You have the vision, you have the future, you have the power, you have the knowledge, you have the ability. Forget about the money. From nowadays, I don't want Somalia to stretch your hand to anybody. You are going to build it and stop this. And you put your condition on any foreign aid coming to you. If you manage to bring or to actually to build the collective together. To manage to build the collective will be able to say no and yes from a strong point of view no and yes and if yes it's according to our condition and it's no because it does not suit us thank you thank you thank you welcome our ustaz Aftakhar uh, who came late here he's, uh, he's a Somali, Pakistani, Indian, everything <laughs> And he has a lot of money, you can <laughs> tie him in. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hanna, for your uh, words of wisdom and encouragement. I wish we could have more time to, to listen your words of wisdom. But uh, despite of the time, we need to cut you up. Sorry for that. Uh, but we will be giving some questions with, with our colleagues, those who are also uh, uh, young academicians, uh, experts in humanitarian and all this uh, stuff. Uh, let me uh, actually begin by ask, uh, asking specifically about your role in Islamic Relief. As we know, Islamic Relief is a Western uh, entity um, it, with its discriminations and limitation uh, of Islamic charities that we know continues to grow. Uh, what has worked well for the Islamic Relief. Could you give us specifically about three, two points uh, for t only two minutes, if you don't mind? One and a half minutes. Yeah. We started with no vision. That's it. Against what, again, this was this against all what I'm saying now. But this was 35 years ago. But we started responding to the need. Be need driven, not fun driven. If you become a fun driven, you will lose your identity. Because the fund will be more powerful than your input. When we started in 1984, it was need-driven for Eritrea in East of Africa. At the time of time. This is number one. No vision, no office, no budget, no, no, no. All the big no's. Like become a big no's. Pinocula, what's his name? Is Pinocula? <laughs> what? Pinocula. <laughs> you see, he speaks English. Huh? <laughs> this is number one. But you have something that you want to do. We never thought that one day we'll be lecturing to others. One day that will be respected by others. One day that will be tens of offices globally. It started from 20 pence. Now it's hundreds. So Aftakhar was working for Islamic Relief here even in Somalia and, and, and uh, Kenya for a few years. And now he's an expert. And you can ask him a lot of questions. Myself, I was with Islamic Relief from the zero point. Always have your zero point. 
And when you have your zero point, you have to calculate your resources. You have to calculate your resources at a zero point. At a zero point. This is how we started at that time. We managed to balance between the fundraising offices and the field offices. And we increased, first of all, the numbers of fundraising offices to enable us to bring more fund. We opened the door from the very beginning. From the very beginning. By attending international global meetings. By trying to become a part of UN. And we became a part of ECOSOC in 1993. By trying to look at world, uh, what, not world, uh, European, uh, what, ECO, I'm not sure it was ECO at that time or not. And we got the partnership with ECO in 2001. You can imagine, 2001, after September 11th, we got the ECO partnership in uh, end of September, beginning of October. The vision was that we, when we actually managed to get out from the first reaction for the family in Africa, is to think logically. Open the door, be inclusive, be responsible and responsive and responding to the disasters, whether it's in, in Iran, whether it's in Sudan, whether it's in Pakistan at that time, whether it's in Bosnia, whether it's in Chechnya, and all this, to become a player, global player. We did not become a global player because our name is Islamic. No way. We became a global player because we were there before anybody else. During the second war in Chechnya, which was the end of 1999, we were there to make the need assessment before UN and, British and, and the International Red Cross uh, ICRC. We were there in November. We started with $10,000 budget. We spent $3 million before March 2000. Because we had the vision at that time. It became mature at that time. So you have to be needs driven. Open your door. Connect to protect. The slogan is, connection is protection. Connection is what? Protection. If you connect, you protect. This is how we started. Simple. Simple. Second thing is, uh, last one is, be always with the grassroots. Strong, strong foundation. You cannot have the big trees unless you have a lot of roots on the ground. They never, ever. Rely only on foreign aid, on foreign donation from uh, international community. Your country, and it, that two, three years ago, when we came, there was a flooding in 2016. You know, in, in uh, near Hergis, is one other small town, and we were visiting there. The local community at that time was raising about $80,000 locally in this area. You have a lot of resources here, but you have to discover it. Connect with the grassroots as well. And don't ever ignore the youth. Some of in the 80s are champions now. Some of them are working in America, in UN. Some of them are working in DFID, actually in, in, in Pakistan and others. Some become CEO and others. Even Brother Abdurrahman Sharif, but he was not Islamic leaf. But I worked with him for six years. And he taught me how to speak, how to stand, how to sit, what to do and what to say. So he can train you, and he has a lot of money. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, before I give the floor to the colleagues, those who would like to comment and ask some few questions, um, I would still request the Doctor to be brief on this one, as he already touched. Humanitarian assistant, it's widely believed that humanitarian assistant is abused by various actors uh, for political reasons. Can a country be ever independent uh, with uh, humanitarian assistance? If you want to become independent, you build strong civil society organization. You build state institution. You build a lot of watchdogs to tell you not to take and to take. Because a lot of humanitarian assistance is politically driven. If you look at the uh, top list of, of UN, of the uh, countries which need humanitarian assistance, it comes up and down. Sometimes it was uh, Central African Republic, sometimes it's Syria, sometimes it's Yemen. It goes up and down. So always, always, 
always government government's assistant on the material living is politically driven because I'm not going to give you money huh unless you follow my policy nothing for free nothing for free so to to to, to resist this you have to build stronger society inside the country that's what to come back as I said earlier on build stronger civil society organization build state institution it might take Somalia a longer time to build it because we are coming out from this uh, 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 failing state to the semi-fragile state and this is your role to keep advocating to have this global not global national strategy of how to build our state institution to try to resist this kind of aid and now I would like to give the floor with our very patient uh, audience and uh, who are also expert on this field. If you have questions, comment, raise your hand, and I will give you the floor. There's no floor here. <laughs> OK. That gentleman. Come on, come on, come on. Come here, come. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th thank you. My name is Abdinur. I'm sorry I missed much of your speech. I just want to ask you a question, just two questions. I would like to ask that question. If I ever come across with someone that I can ask, and I'm happy that I met with you. First question is, and there is much debate in the field of economics that I read, that I write about, and uh, one strong argument is that in the last year, I read an article written by an Institute for Overseas Development. That's very, very common. And the report states that in aid, there are many kind of aid, as you guys know more. And one of it is the aid for development. And the report states that it increased the development on African development as much as 8%. So do you think that the reliance on the aid for development is good for an African economy? Another question is that that much supports with you that aid is just another way of uh, developing new colonization in Africa. I'm talking those who believe in world system theory, dependency theories, and others believe that it's uh, just as a conspiracy as it has been in 100 years before. So is there any argument based on your experience, your experience in this field, is there any way that aid was, has been set or developed to be in a new colonization, okay? Thank you. So, uh, humanitarian colonialism or humanitarian imperialism is something we do, even as Muslim organization. Because sometimes those donor organizations come with a parachute. I explain this a lot in the case of Syria. When I mix with a lot of Syrian organizations over the last eight years, since the conflict started, they said many times, we don't want food. Enough, enough, enough. But one of the donors wake up in the morning, make a phone call to the organization, I have 100,000 or 200,000 pounds for this food. But he said, no. They were forced to take this donation as part of the fact they don't want it. That's why I agree with you that actually aid sometimes is not independent. The best aid we can do is to tell them even if we are, if, let, let us say that we have a, a, a humanitarian problem here, okay? Whether there's a drought or a famine or a flooding or an earthquake or whatever you call it. What a condition as a collective, what a condition as a collective that a part of this humanitarian response has to be in building the local community. This is one of my dreams. One of my dreams. At least 30% of the humanitarian response has to be given to the local community to build it while there's a conflict. To save the 70%. To build the community through capacity building, through building local civil society organization, local municipality, and, 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 and. This is your condition as collective. You want to give me humanitarian assistance? Thank you. But I want 30% to be spent, invested in the local community, including development. Sometimes we can start development in an area which does not have any conflict. 
to, to, to take some part of the 30%. So if we divide the Hamiltonian assistant in 70%, huh? Hamiltonian assistant, and 30% of a specialized Hamiltonian assistant by building the community, this one in the, in, in the few years to come will be able to have built a stronger local community to enable us to be aid independent. Sometimes, what, what's my worry? Uh, can I talk? Yeah. Post-conflict, which is actually, brother, uh, what do you call it? Uh, reconstruction. I am so scared to death to get the reconstruction money in a fragile or failing state without having any institution. It will go down the drain. Because reconstruction is billions of dollars. And if we don't have this stronger civil society organization or state institution, it's definitely going to be drained and wasted. So really, really be careful of your money, of reconstruction when the big money comes. Are you willing, are you able to deal with this money at the moment or not? Because more money will come, more corruption will be. This is my worry, especially with post-Yemen conflict, post-Syria conflict. Because maybe billions and billions of dollars will be poured in this country, even in Iraq as well. Be careful with the, the amount of money you receive when you don't have the stronger civil society or state institution. Thank yes, you. brother. Okay. I will give that gentleman at the back. He has to come to the front. So we are I using this man. Shake, shake your hand. Uh -huh. I, have, I have a large for so I'll listen. Oh, okay. I have a project. Okay. okay. Please. Thank you, brother. Uh, this is very informative uh, uh, kind of forum. Um, I have a couple of questions. One question leads to the one you talked about, which is kind of how can you localize the humanitarian support? Because what we often see is that when the humanitarian support comes to a country that is coming out post conflict, it happens that. Everything comes from the outside, rather than inside. How can you do that? I mean, we often see a self-fulfilled prophecy that you have a recurring issue with the, with the uh, humanitarian uh, kind of development of the humanitarian aid area. The construction you talk about is absolutely right. If you don't have enough capacity within the locality, within the local kind of population, within the local uh, state or governance, it's really difficult to have that. But in terms of humanitarian aid and humanitarian assistance, how can you manage to have a local actors uh, lead the process? Thank you. Uh, to help with the local economy, you buy locally. Because some of the uh, aid agencies stress that to send you, actually, the equipment from their country or the aid material from the country. Some country love to give the food material from its own, without mentioning the name of the country. It could be extremely expensive. If you spend, if you put the, that's why I come back to, to the, the first question, the collective. If the collective say, no, we're going to buy, if this material or this food material is locally present, why don't you buy it from the local, uh, local market? This will help you to stand on your feet, to build the local economy during the time of disaster to build the local economy, to buy locally, to empower locally. And actually coming back to it, during this disaster, we have, we have, we have to ask for capacity building of the local organization and participation of the local organization. The participatory approach, bottom up, from the very beginning. You don't just wait till the money comes to you, but you have to be a part of the discussion from the planning and the designing from the very beginning, and this is your own right. It's your absolute right. I was discussing this morning with uh, another meeting about the relationship between uh, the, the international and the, and the local. It's like a fat kiss. You know fat? Fat you eat. F-A-T, kiss, you kiss. Fat is the role of the international organization. Fundraise, it's acronym, advocate and train. Don't touch the ground. KISS is the local organizations. Is knowledge-based, innovative, 
sustainable solution. This is my role. Brother, this is my role. You give me the fat, I give you the kiss. You got it, give me the fat. <laughs> so it's equal partnership. And this will come back to the issue of respect and dignity. You have to respect me because I am the one who has the know-how. I have the one who has the access. You don't have an access without me. You don't know the know-how. The know-how means that I'll be able to cre be creative and have the innovative, sustainable solution. We sit down at the same table equal. Your money is equivalent to my idea, to my experience, to my dignity, to my access, which you don't have. Without me, you cannot access these areas or you'll be able to develop the local, actually, solution. You give me the fat, I give you what? <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, just to save the time, we will take three questions at a time. So, that gentleman. Um, thank you, Professor Reddy, um, for coming and issue this is a very positive presentation. Um, actually, um, we, like our foundation, work on the same topic. But in what is coming to Somali, in the Somali context, one of the challenges is that I follow the death of Rafael. When there's a humanitarian, you can go, you cannot go to the Fulmuta program. And if you cannot do the Fulmuta program, it will be very difficult to um, actually mitigate um, the humanitarian crisis. <coughs> um, also, the international humanitarian community they were talking about for the last few years um, what they call um, commercial investment. For example, in, in 2017, they spent in Somalia 1.2 billion in aid. Um, and in 2018, also, they predicted another drought, um, and they asked for about 1.6 billion. So, um, what do you think of the uh, on the ground? It's uh, very, very difficult and challenging to um, uh, materialize uh, those kind of aid. 1.2 billion is, is quite a significant amount um, in Somalia. Uh, uh, so, and then, um, uh, uh, so how can we? What is the best way to how the development of the humanitarian cooperation? On, on my second question would be, what do you think? Um, this idea is saying that now there is a need um, to have a, a commercial investment. Commercial investment. Uh, commercial investment by the humanitarian community. Um, as you say, um, without having an effective and, um, and operational state institution, also there is another difficulty with this, how to be um, held accountable the humanitarian organization themselves. Mm. Even sometimes they may claim that they brought the country so uh, millions, millions of, of money to Somalia, whether um, they are the um, from Muslim uh, countries or from the other commercial communities. So also, what's your advice also? I come back to what I mentioned five minutes ago about those 1.2, 1.68. Nearly in two years or three years, you have received $3 billion. What I mentioned earlier, can we put a pressure on the donor countries to have a share of this for resilience and development and building local community? And instead of spending $3 billion in two years on he maintain response only, I can take a share. This is what you need to do the lobby. This money you need to use the research. As some Abdurrahman was telling me, he said, there's, there's academic amongst you here. There's a researcher amongst you here. This is what we need to invest in papers, not in speeches. Because the governments do not believe in talks, believe in figures and facts. If we'll be able as a collective to produce research paper, to tell them, give us half of this money to build the local community, to start resilience at the time of disaster, and put the pressure. Before, September, before, to, uh, before the World Humanitarian Summit uh, 2016 in, in, in Istanbul, the Syrians were pressurizing the UN. You know what, what they said? They said that the UN is, is, is spending more than 80% of its fund inside Syria. And there's six million or five, six million refugees outside Syria. 
They're spending the money in area controlled by the government, not in the other area, which is number six or seven million internally displaced Syrian inside Syria. This went up because the Syrian organization put their hands together. If you want to change policy, you have to believe in the collective, this is number one. Number two, you have to produce a research paper, like the brother who talked about ODI. Somebody came and talked about ODI, Overseas Development Institute. Okay? Let's see. ODI talk about the research. They make the research, which the government listened to. Harvard University and others talk about research. They put the research paper on the table. We don't put any research table, uh, paper on the table. We don't believe in the collective. So how can we protect the wastage of resources given to us during the humanitarian response and not being able to take some part of it for resilience and development? If we start this process by, by building the collective, today what the Somali Consortium, what do you call them? Uh, Somali uh, ANGO Consortium, if they have now 100 organizations, we don't even know how many Somali organizations registered in the country. Can we start looking at the number of organizations and their wealth and making them accountable to a body? You said accountability. With this accountability, you have to buy the body to, to register and to follow up. It's not only that the ministry will register, but who is going to follow up the expenditure of even the local organization and protect it from corruption. Is that right? This is, this, this is the, for the first question. Second question was what? You said two questions, or you, or you are happy now? Huh? I have answered both of them. You forgot? This policy is changing. You, yeah. They, 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 say, um, they say if there are any humanitarian or emergencies, we can't open the fundamentals. This is what I'm saying. Yeah. But it's you to produce the paper to lobby the government with the collectors. If you have got three, four, five hundred organizations, produce a very high quali quality paper and put this pressure on those donors, they will listen to you. They will listen. But a lot of organizations that are very um, um, uh, Any other questions? <coughs> yes. Can you can you stand, please? Somali to be an independent state, an independent society. 
so for me it's actually um, sad yes, that we need to ask you know maybe people side we need to actually put ourselves How is it? and actually do uh, best way to uh, you know win-win solution to provide win-win solution for competing with somebody thank you thank you let us look at the not the empty part of the cup or the glass. Because you said that we don't know if the number of the organization in the country we might have 5% of the organizations are able. Let us let them to sit down to draw a strategy and invite the others to enable us to put this strategic paper to lobby the government. Without having this collective, brothers and sisters, you cannot, you cannot actually change a policy, because you want to change the policy. You want to change the policy of the United Nations, you have to produce paper, research. Then you have to have some friends inside the United Nations to lobby for you. Then you have to have an international organization who believes in you, lobby for you. See the process, how, how it's happening? Lobbying, lobbying, lobbying. Even to 1993, when I went for the first time to the United Nations to register Islamic League for three of us, I have no idea what to talk about. And when some of the ambassadors said, I, 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 don't, I need to read your, 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 your record, uh, your, your papers, before I said, OK, because you have to have a consensus. One of the uh, 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 ladies who there was from Egypt, she you know she, she, what, she, what she said? Did you lobby? I said, what do you mean? I was ignorant at that time. You have to admit that you are ignorant. I said, what do you mean, doctor? So did you lobby? Did you talk to the French ambassador? Did you talk to the Costa Rica ambassador, to the Russian ambassador, to the Chinese ambassador, to the Irish ambassador, to all these ambassadors? I said, how? I said, go around. Go around and talk to every nature. It took me a week to distribute leaflets and reports and others to get it from being said no to change the decision to say yes. Me and my colleague. The lobbying is something, it's an art by itself. It's an art, it's a profession. Not anybody can make lobbying. You cry, fine, we'll say thank you. Where's the, where's the facts? No facts. Your emotional speech has to be accompanied with your very well, docu very well written document from a credible institution. Not only any, anyone can write the document for you. You have to find the credible, you have to look at the funding, the collective funding from the organizations, then the lobbying amongst your, your INGO, then actually the longest amongst nearby countries, then the, then it's, it's a process. You know, this 25% for the local organizations, see, I, what one of the localization issues is 25% should be given to the local. How much you give to Somalia or how much you spend given to the local up to now? 2% two, two, two of 25%. Because there's nobody lobbying. No, no, no. Talk, we're, talk, we're not talk, talking about Somalia, we're talking about generally. Okay? 2%, because there's nobody's lobbying. You see, you're right. People said 25%, and you take 2%, 10% of what they decided will never make any impact by giving 10% of the humanitarian response to you as local organization. How you build your own capacity with the 2%? We will need to break, uh, I think, in 10 minutes or so, but we'll give some few questions if you have. I think the prayer time is almost uh, on the, around the corner. So let me give uh, two more people. And, uh, and collect their power and strength to go forward for this uh, country. But uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the problem of this country can be the diaspora, because uh, they come they come when they are campaigning to their countries, so that uh, to to fulfill the policy of that uh, uh, the, that country. So what do you think when they are the problem of the country? How can they solve? The problem of this country. You know what I said? There's challenges. The challenge among the challenges is the diaspora. 
Among the challenges is the tribal leaders. Among the challenges are the young, growing uh, political parties. Among the challenges are the proscribed groups. Among the challenges is poverty and the economy and the security in the country. So what I'm saying, uh, brother, what's your name? Adam. Adam. Oh, our father. How's mother uh, Eve? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is fine. she fine? Yes. <laughs> yeah, give my salam to Kabil and Habil. <laughs> and tell them not to kill one another. <laughs> and uh, so coming back to this, I think we need to, we need by hook or by crook to let this process happening. If it doesn't happen, you know what will happen? We'll be fragmented. Some of the diaspora will be pro the government, they are actually representing. Some other diaspora from the same country will be against. But if we look at Somalia as one image, I'll give you an example. I was in Egypt in 2013, 2012, and we want to make a national conference for the first time ever for civil society organization in the whole country on the national level. We have the Christian from different denomination, of the Muslims as well as from different denominations, you know, Salafi, Sufi, Khwani, Jamaat, all this, okay? You know what was the first point when you collect all these people on the table? Leave your organization behind, <coughs> leave your background behind, it's only Egypt. It's only Somalia. It's not your clan, it's whatever. If you will be able to build this process was, you know what, why I keep saying it uh, energetically? Because if, you, if somebody at your age and at your education cannot do it, nobody will do it. Nobody will do it. And it's not something easy. It's difficult. It's difficult. So the diaspora will come with a package, but you need to put the globe, and the, no, the national strategic plan for the all five or six challenges. How to deal with it? Well, anybody will be able to champion this or this we're talking about dream? Yes, Abdurrahman, you want to say something? You have to speak, you and uh, Aftakhar. Why are you shy? <laughs> uh, you finished, uh, I think, Fatima. Fatima, okay, another sister. Come on, sister Fatima, I need to take a selfie with you. Okay. So, go on. I just want to make a comment. Yes. That you said it sounds really good. However, I don't know how much you know for someone when you say people have to just the local group. So, what I feel you have to do it if it's not the kind of, you know, you invest in the local group. So, like the farmer, they have so many, it's a big country. I can go out and go outside the city and invest in what I have. So, what? Me, I do everything that you said because I feel like there's a long way. Okay, so security is an issue. That's why I put the challenges. Yeah. The, so you have a problem tree, and you have a solution tree. A part of the problem tree is the security, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. A part of the problem tree is the division of the country to diaspora, to clans, to tribal leaders, to political party, to to all the. You, you see, a long way. Did we start, <coughs> or not yet? Okay. Did we start? We need to start. What I'm saying, sister, I'm not going to give you a golden solution. What I'm saying, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of resources, but need somebody to take the risk and start. I don't know what to say. And if, if you don't take the risk and start, there's no, it will be, will be, will be in the catch 22. Can we start? I did not, I don't want to say did we start. Can we start? Start in anywhere. I tell you something. Make like a pilot case. In areas which has less security problem. And let the rest of the country see the fruits of it. See the fruits of it. And from there you build on this snowball to the others. And connect and communicate with the people living in this area who have less security. If we go to be afraid of taking the risk and the challenge, we'll never make a change. We'll never make a change. 
will never make a change. You see, the people who, uh, uh, who scared you by whatever is happening are benefiting from me being quiet, not trying, 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 trying. If you want to become a Nobel Peace Prize winner in chemistry or in astronomy, how many times you make the experiment? Sister, this could be thousands of times. How many failures you will have before you start to achieve? If you give up, you will never make a change. This one thing. And in the community work, if you don't bring the collective and fight for I'll give you another example. 11 years ago, we wanted to make a collective in the in, in, in UK called Muslim Child's Forum. We're still struggling after 11 years in the middle of Europe with 17 organizations only, not 170 organizations. But we are working slowly. Work, and Abdul Rahman was there. You know, why didn't you stand up and tell her what's Muslim? Come here. Come here. Come here. I tried to be a government officer. Come here. Come here. Tell her your experience and your struggle in the Muslim Church Forum within, within a developed country. I'm kind of aware of how many champions. Yeah, but actually, he. Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, uh, Dr. Rani had the vision one day that actually different Islamic organizations of different school of thinking. Salafi, Ikhwani, Sufi, Jamaat, Jamaati, Shia, Sunni, could come together. Uh, and everyone was telling him, you're crazy, you can never bring them together. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, he managed. He struggled a lot. Uh, they wouldn't even give money, membership fees, though they had millions and millions of, of pounds they would raise. Um, and his vision was simple. He said, you put 10,000 pounds, $10,000, you will gain millions of dollars, right? Uh, what he wanted is, is this uh, idea of uh, policy documents and policy influence. Uh, uh, um, and after a few years, you know, it was just uh, two people, was it two people, three people working in this organization, myself including. You would go to uh, members of parliament and they will think, you know, that you are, uh, uh, you're an organization that has uh, 100 staff. 200 stuff. It's the difference that what you write uh, in terms of policy papers and documents that can influence actually 100. It doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, uh, maybe one month of work, you know, sitting in a document, gathering information, but the outreach is more powerful than you talking, for example, in this forum to 10 people or 30 people, uh, etc. Uh, the vision was that uh, uh, after September 11, a lot of Muslim charities couldn't open bank accounts, uh, couldn't transfer money uh, to other countries, were accused uh, uh, indiscriminately of being, you know, terrorists without being terrorists. Uh, and, you know, that thing changed. I think, you know, uh, uh, you see a lot of people talking about Islamophobia now in the West. Um, back in those days, maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, nobody used to talk about Islamophobia. It was only the Muslim community pushing, pushing, pushing. And now it's become part of the mainstream. But it's been a struggle for 10 years or more to really push the idea that Islamophobia is real, that there's an anti-Muslim sentiment, uh, and that things need to be challenged. So, uh, you know, uh, as they say, Rome wasn't built in, in one day. So it will take time until, you know, you want to push your idea, you want things changed. Uh, um, but I think I go back to... Uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Hani uh, said, it's not about talking only, it's about action, right? So if you feel that the country, your people deserve change, you have to be the first one to be that change so that others will follow you. Uh, and, uh, and Dr. Hani, I think, you know, his experience is that uh, he decided with an idea of Islamic relief and I guess a lot of people, you know, didn't believe that he would reach uh, those limits. Uh, a first donation of 20, 20p, was it? A young boy, 20p, said, let me be the first one to donate. Uh, now Islamic Leaf is $100 million. No, no, no. Sorry, 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 sorry. $300 million, if you include all the fundraising offices. And it just happened with one idea, and grown and grown and grown. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, one day he decided to leave, I think back in 2008, 
And then uh, everybody told him, you're crazy. Why are you leaving the organization? Because they never thought that someone uh, uh, who, um, uh, who built an organization uh, could one day leave it. It's called, you know, someone calls it the founder's syndrome. Uh, but then he left it uh, because he believed that he needed to build bridges with people from other faith and other backgrounds uh, uh, around the world. Uh, and I think, you know, in the UK, you have about uh, hundreds or 200 Islamic charities. Um, and every one of them sees, even if they don't have the same school of thinking, they don't have the same ideology, they're from different countries, uh, um, see him actually as a role model. Uh, for the whole um, uh, Muslim community. And he was one of the first ones actually to be awarded by the Queen, uh, an OBE. It was in 2000, uh, 2004. Uh, and after him, there's been many awards to the Muslim community. Uh, um, so he, he's really a role model for many uh, people across the country. And, uh, and nobody sees him, you know, uh, he's Egyptian of origin, but if you go to, to, uh, to the UK, he's respected by people of all nationalities, Muslims of all nationalities, Shia, Sunnis, uh, 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 Sufis, Salafis, Ikhwanis. It's very difficult to have, uh, find someone like that. And that's, you know, the, the qualities of Dr. Hani. Uh, I would say he had the vision, and he said he'll step uh, in you one day. If you go to him, and you say, I have a crazy idea, Dr. Hani. He will tell you to do it. Because if you believe in it, you have to be the change. That's uh, Dr. Hani for you. Do you want to say one minute because of the prayer? Uh, just one minute. Can you please, can you please mind for one minute? For, uh, we will wrap up with the meeting. Uh, I'll just say one thing. Give a voice to the people. Two minutes. Uh, well, all of them have a lot of wisdom. Muhammad, my brother here, everybody. So definitely I don't have a lot to offer, but I'll just say a couple of things. Uh, I mean, I've been in Somalia since 2008. While we live by day-to-day -day challenges, we can easily forget where we have come from. And of course, there are people who have been here, who uh, were raised here, so they can appreciate even more. So one thing that I always say, that Somalia has come a very long way, in spite of all the challenges. From an outsider view, what I can see in 10 years, it has been a phenomenal progress. And only God knows, inshallah, maybe in the next 10 years, uh, when we sit in, in 2029, it will be, inshallah, very farther. So Somalia, in Somali, as a nation, it's a very resilient people. Second thing is linked to this, which is the youth. Because it's the youth which is going to make it. This is the future, and Somalia is lucky to have 70% plus of its population youth. So the future belongs to Somalia, uh, but it belongs to you guys. And it's not just the youth. You are not only youth. You represent a constituency. That constituency is the entity that you come from, that you have established and contributed to. And, and if you take the number of, in terms of the percentages of the people of this particular caliber in the entire Somalia youth, this can be 0.001%. So it's these civil society organizations and entities which can be part of, uh, which can be part of uh, what Somalia will become. One thing that I could hear from the last moments, because I came a bit late, of Dr. Hani's speech, and that's extremely important, that is the state building. Because you can't have humanitarian systems uh, which are viable, which are operational, which are relevant, without a functional state. So that is where the humanitarian, the development, and the state building needs to merge and converge for its viability. Thank you. Jazakumullah. Uh, Dr. Hani, if you don't mind, we would like to end uh, and now. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Uh, on that note, we will end our discussion this afternoon. I would like to thank Dr. Hani Albanna for coming and serving uh, for 40 years of experience.
uh, would like to also to thank our participants. Uh, thank you for coming and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.